Welcome to MuggleCast, your weekly ride into the Wizarding World fandom. I'm Andrew. I'm Eric. And I'm Micah. This week, we bust open the Muggle mailbag and listen to your voicemails on all things Goblet of Fire. It's been a while since we've opened up the mailbag, and it was getting quite full. We were looking like Santa Claus on Christmas Eve, am I right? Oh, you're right. (laughs) Laura couldn't handle it. She said, no mail. The bag is too big. I can't handle it. No, Laura decided to follow the advice of Miriam Margulies and no longer be a Harry Potter fan. <laughs> so oh! she's not here this week. Is that what it is? <laughs> That's what it is. Uh, yeah, that, that was sense. the final straw. I convinced Laura. She's like, yeah, she's right. She was like, yeah, she's got a point. Uh, no, Laura uh, was planning on being here, and at the last minute, she had something come up, and she couldn't make it, unfortunately. Um, she's okay, but it was something she couldn't get out of. So, unfortunately, she's not here. However, some good news is that a new all-girls muggle cast is taping next week. So, there will be a guileless episode in the weeks ahead. So, stay tuned for that. <laughs> so, what you're really saying is we strategically planned it. So, it was just the three of us this week so that the girls could have it next week. No, no, I'm not saying that. <laughs> Laura was planning on being no, I know, on I know. until 30 minutes ago. <laughs> yes. You're supposed to go along with it, Andrew. You're supposed to go along with yeah, it. Yeah, I well, you know, 650 episodes though. That's it's another milestone for us oh, this week. That's exciting. Wow. At this point, they're ticking by <laughs> every couple of weeks. It's a new 50 episodes. It seems like. Yeah, it's flying by. I can't wait for episode 700 now in another well, year or so. 700 is going to be very special. We'll get David Heyman back. He's yeah. not doing anything. We'll see if uh, we'll see if he's any better at dueling club. Wait, he already actually won dueling. We'll see if you've improved at dueling club, Micah. I mean, we could literally say to him, David, it's been 500 episodes since you've been on, the- <laughs> <laughs> which is wild. Episode 700 in our 20th year. That'll that's a pretty nice time. That, yeah, that is pretty magical. It is wild to think that the show has been doing. You know, we've been doing this show for 19 years, 19 entire years. I know that's a big thing. We'll be making a thing of it throughout the year. Uh, since it's the distance between the epilogue and Harry's seventh year at Hogwarts. But uh, yeah, that's well, uh, it. Yes. Yeah, to your point, though, Andrew, I don't know if there's uh, th- there there may be somebody out there who doesn't like the fact that we're still podcasting after all these years. And she's part of the Harry Potter cast. Oh, Miriam Margulies. Oh, we should do a cam. We should get a cameo from her. <laughs> Let's and see what she does. And no? say that we did. Let's get another one from Dan Vogler. What? Oh, okay. he was well, great. So let's get to this story. <laughs> this made a lot of headlines, and some people, I think, were feeling a little hurt over the last week. Miriam Margulies, who plays Professor Sprout in the Harry Potter movies, she said in an interview that Harry Potter fans, who are adults now, need to grow up. Harry Potter, I worry about Harry Potter fans because they should be over that by now. You know, I mean, it was 25 years ago. And it's for children. I think it's for children. But they get stuck in it. I, and I do cameos and people say, oh, we're having a Harry Potter themed wedding. And I think, gosh, what's their first night of f- fun going to be? <laughs> I, ca- I, ca- I, I can't even think about it. No. <laughs> uh, Harry Potter is wonderful. I'm very grateful to it. It's, it's over. <laughs> <laughs> this woman is very hard to get mad at first. Can I start by saying that? She's yeah. a delight. She is. She's very entertaining across the board. In ter- anything you watch her in, she is highly entertaining. And I wonder if that's what this is. I saw another interview after this one, and she kind of doubled down. She did <laughs> emphasize that this is her opinion. Look, it's a fact of our Harry Potter lives that a lot of people see Harry Potter as for children. Most of these people have not read the books. Maybe a lot of them have not seen the movies. But some people just perceive Harry Potter as being for kids. It's unfortunate because we all know, everybody listening knows, it's not just for kids. It's an incredible story. What I really take issue with is, does she realize that adults also watch Disney movies? Watch Bluey, which is a children's television show that adults love? There are lots of things quote unquote, made for kids that adults love too. I think too that her perspective, like we we kind of have to understand, like for her, it's okay if it was just a job or it was just 25 years ago. Like she did say in that 
short clip that she's grateful to Harry Potter. It obviously was the first time I had seen her in anything, brought her to my attention. You know, she she's given it its due as far as what it did for her career. But she was already in her 60s when Chamber of Secrets came out. And so, you know, to an adult, to a to a, a you know middle aged to senior adult who had the Harry Potter, you know, phenomenon through that lens, I can understand them thinking it should be over by now because they don't necessarily understand it the same way that we do. And I was texting Micah earlier in the week, but like Maria Margulies actually did a one woman show based on the works of Charles Dickens called Dickens Women. She started that in 1989 and it reprised in like 2007, 2008. And so it's okay if Charles Dickens is her author, <laughs> if she thinks that that his books are going to live forever, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, it's it's also okay if we don't think that that's it for us and if we take these these books instead. Yeah, I, I watched a show she was in called Impossibly Australian, and she mm. does all these little trips. And she, she's literally driving an RV, which... That in and of itself is worth the watch. Yeah, where where can I see this? I'm going to pay for the subscription right now. I think I watched it on Netflix. I don't know if it's still on there. You could probably look it up, see what streaming service it's on. But and and you interviewed her, didn't you, Eric? It was actually for, for yeah, it was for Dickens Women. Yeah, uh, when it came to Chicago, I, I met her. Um, and she's very much so that the the full clip that's on YouTube is like a four minute segment that includes this, uh, you know, clip. She talks about how she's been viewed as kind of like this provocateur or kind of sassy lady. She's kind of just being herself. Um, but a lot of people didn't know that about her until she started doing interviews with people like Graham Norton, who are going to get to like the funny bits out of you and stuff. So, you know, now on on Cameo, I think what what really made headlines recently is that guy who paid her to roast him. Uh, and she, you know, the Harry Potter fan who paid various actors, which she's uh, very good at, by the way. Well, yeah, and she's incredible at it. So I, I think that's what this is. I think a lot of it is in jest. It's okay to say, you know, I worry about Harry Potter. Fan. Like I worry about global warming. Like it's just one of those things. <laughs> you know, what what are we well, going to do about global and, warming? And somebody brought this up, and I apologize if it was one of you or was somebody who's a yeah. member of our Slug Club, but they said, well, clearly she's still good to do cameos. Like well, for as much as she thinks that it's yeah. over. She's still making money off of these fans. The so. Harry Potter fans. Yeah. yeah. We're getting some good comments in our Discord. Elsie said, why put an expiration date on something you love? Lydia57 said, HBO Max isn't spending $250 million for a show for kids. And Liza said, <laughs> she doesn't realize that many of us are over here needing to do inner child work because all the adults in her generation failed us. <laughs> that is the wow. biggest clapback. <laughs> Of all time. This is the next Miriam Margulies here who said that. And that somebody also brought up the fact that she has never read the books. Is, isn't that true? So I, I think that's as far right, as we yeah. know. I think yeah. that's a huge point to bring up here because if we're just talking about the movies, yeah, I can understand where she's coming from. But so many people grew up reading Harry Potter that it has become such a foundational piece of their childhood. So that the fact that she is calling that out here. I like in terms of how I react to it, honestly, it doesn't really bother me. Like I I don't know, maybe it's because of who she is and the fact that I've seen her in other things and I've seen her talk yeah. in public. Like this statement from her just it, it doesn't it, rattle me the same way it, it, it seems to have rattled other people. It, it bothers me because it reinforces other people's views that adults mm. our age should grow out of Harry Potter. That's the only reason it really bugs me. Or Disney or Star Wars or yeah. So yeah, anything. I mean, there's look, listeners, enjoy what you want. We all need an escape. We all need things to help us clear our heads and. Uh, To paraphrase one of our uh, friends from Fantasy Fangirls, she said on Millennial a couple of weeks ago, we always have to use our brains for like hard things. How about being able to use our brains for just like fun things? And that's what Harry Potter and fantasy novels allow us to do. So let us enjoy it. Look, as somebody who is immersed in sports, you could easily make the same argument, right? Like you play sports as a yeah. kid growing up, you play soccer, you play basketball, you play baseball, you play football. It's like, well, why don't you grow out of that? Like, why are you watching that when you're, you know, in your twenties and your thirties? 
It's just it's I a actually, bunch of nonsense. I actually want, do you have an answer to that? Because I actually want to know. I don't. Why does it? <laughs> sports, watching know, sports you, is fun. But like it when, is. when I watch NFL games on Sundays, I see people dressed up in like, you know, Vikings gear or full That's body their makeup. Cosplay. That's, their, That's cosplay. their cosplay. They're so into it. They're, they're like, they think they're hyper masculine, but they're not any different than like somebody wearing a cloak to a Harry Potter conference. It's the same thing. I just think it it is crucial, and this is this has been a fun discussion, but it is crucial that we do not take ourselves too seriously as as, as adults <laughs> in anything. Like I can listen yes. to this clip, I can have a laugh. It's a little bit important that we look at ourselves and go, ha ha. Like it has been a while. We've been doing this show for like 19, 20 years. Like, did everything we grow out of it? Uh, you know? So we're kids at heart. Yeah. So, well, again. We here at MuggleCast support your love for Harry Potter, and uh, that's one reason the show's been a success. For a lot of people, we have we feel like they're Harry Potter friends, and we're happy to be there for you. Well, Micah, you're planning a new bonus MuggleCast for our patrons and Apple Podcast subscribers this week, right? Yeah, so we're going to be talking about the three individuals who are on the short list to produce the new Harry Potter TV series, and our thoughts on the release date. For this new Harry Potter TV show, it was announced, uh, was it maybe like two weeks ago, uh, that the new show will be out in 2026. Andrew and I did a quick Instagram live to talk about it, but definitely want to get Eric's thoughts on this as well. And then talk about the three people who are on this short list. Do we know anything about them? Like, how do we feel? Yeah. So we're going to be doing that in bonus MuggleCast. I think we can expect probably a lot of our bonus MuggleCast segments as we get closer and closer to the release date of the TV show to be focused on that. Yeah, agreed. And the three names you mentioned are three people who are in the running to write the Harry Potter television series. So this is a really big deal. And listeners, what else have you missed in bonus MuggleCast? Well, our analysis of an incredible inside look at the relationship between J.K. Rowling and Warner Brothers, in which we learned bombshells like other Harry Potter spinoffs that have been in the works. We also had a discussion about a Harry Potter fan fiction that is getting turned into a new book. And we have uh, two bonus MuggleCast installments every month. We're doing a lot of fun stuff over there. So definitely check out patreon.com slash MuggleCast. Or again, uh, through the paid Apple Podcast subscription, you can now get bonus MuggleCast installments. I will say that the one bonus MuggleCast that we did on the relationship between J.K. Rowling and Warner Brothers is almost like another episode. With, it was with like 45 long, minutes. <laughs> it was very long. Um, but I think a lot of really great uh, conversation. And I know I always say this, but as it relates to Apple Podcasts, I do feel like it is a really good deal. Like as somebody who listens to a lot of other podcasts, paying four ninety nine a month for That's right. all of our episodes, bonus muggle cast, ad free, early access. I look at it as you go to your local coffee shop, you pay for a coffee. You go out to a bar, get a drink with friends. Both of those things likely are going to cost you more than four ninety nine. Put one of those aside for the entire month, and you get really great content as a result of it. A uh, cameo from Miriam Margulies is one hundred seventy dollars. <laughs> That's thirty four months of bonus MuggleCast or MuggleCast on Patreon. <laughs> How much for Dan Fogler? <laughs> I think she. He's I don't want to know what you paid for my birthday. Oh no, no, no! It, it has nothing to do with that. It'd be like <laughs> he did what it is for he free, ch- right? What does he charge? <laughs> he did that one for free. He we actually it. asked for I a mean, refund. One hundred twenty. He was he was obviously high when he did yours. He was so we super high. We got we got a <laughs> refund on that actually. Yeah, but no, you bring up a good point, Micah, and listeners are supporting an independent podcast. So, well, I say that because I I wanted listeners to feel like we're offering them quality right Mm -hmm. for for what they're paying for Mm -hmm. okay well it's time for muggle mail now and we're going to start with voicemails we love 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 when listeners send in feedback so let's start with this voicemail from becca and she discusses gringotts being a security nightmare hey muggle cast i have a funny thing i always think about uh in goblet of fire about molly purchasing harry's dress robes. I work at a bank. 
when someone comes to withdraw funds from their account, we need to see their driver's license. So I always wonder how the hell Molly Weasley was able to get gold from Harry Potter's vault. She's not a legal guardian. She doesn't have any power of attorney paperwork. She's just this friend's mom coming and getting gold from his vault. Makes no sense. But I guess maybe Gringotts is different. I don't know. They seem pretty strict. But I guess they're not because Molly can just get Harry's gold. Thoughts? Because I don't get it. <laughs> Thanks, MuggleCast. Bye. Could Molly have uh, be like an authorized user? Like how you can add somebody to a credit card or bank account? If she was, Harry would be like, please take it all. <laughs> yeah. It is wonky with Gringotts to agree with Becca here. Um, and in fact, Sirius Black, a convicted felon, is able to mail order request his money be removed from his vault somehow without tipping anybody off that Sirius Black is removing money from his vault in order to buy Harry the Fireball. Like, the whole system of money withdrawals from somebody else, from convicted felon, all of that is just very wonky in the Harry Potter books. Yeah, there's there's a really great comment in the Discord from Paxton Jameson who says, the goblins were scared of receiving one of her howlers. So that must have kept them in check. That'll do it. I do like the analysis. I, I think it's one of those things you don't necessarily pay any attention to while you're reading the series. You just assume, okay, Harry is staying with the Weasleys. Molly's going to go take care of everything. Mm -hmm. But to your point, Eric, like if she can take out for Harry's robes, I mean, she could take out whatever she wants. <laughs> well, you yeah. know, and the thing is, it, it it is funny because you know Becca says she's work works at a bank. You do need a you know driver's license or you should have one to withdraw someone's money. But you know what? Did you know you don't need any identification to deposit money into somebody's account? If you have the account number, you can just give them the money and say here oh. and they'll take it. So I should share my account number on the podcast right now and see and if people anybody... will just, people you'll probably get hacked actually maybe i should just share my venmo that'll probably be safer mm. all right this next voicemail comes from brenna and she has a pretty significant theory about portraits and horcruxes hey muggle cast my name is brenna i'm a proud hufflepuff from ohio my patronus is a weasel and my favorite book of the series is goblet of fire so I have a theory I'd like to put out to y'all, and I don't know if it's one that's ever been discussed on the podcast before. So let me know what you think and if you feel that my theory is worthy of being declared canon. So my theory surrounds portraits, horcruxes, and why Dumbledore was able to recognize Riddle's diary as a horcrux when others were unable to do so. So my theory is that portraits are not that dissimilar from horcruxes. The key difference being that horcruxes are created to contain a living piece of the soul and therefore require use of dark magic because you have to kill a person to rip apart your own soul. Whereas a portrait, it uses magic to create a tether to the portrait. It creates a resting place for the soul to remain after a person passes. So that person can still continue to contribute to the wizarding world. Which, <laughs> sorry, that's my son Isaac, my future little Hufflepuff. Mm -hmm. um, so my theory is that the portraits being similar to Horcruxes, uh, in that they are a resting place for the soul after a person passes mm -hmm. away, this is a way for uh, important wizards and witches in the wizarding world to still contribute to everyday life uh, even after their death. Because if you know, the portraits in Dumbledore's office are of significant people. They're of past headmasters, headmistresses, and past leaders, significant people in history whom you would want to speak to and problem solve if you had something going on uh, in your role as headmaster that you would want assistance with. Who better to speak to and get opinions from than past headmasters and headmistresses? So my theory is that the portraits are 
regulated and monitored by the ministry, and only certain people who are deemed either significant enough to the wizarding world or those who are only rich enough, like the Malfoys, the Blacks, the Lestranges, uh, to increase the palms of the ministry, get to have a portrait commissioned of them. So being Dumbledore and all that he has done for the wizarding world has already had his portrait commissioned. And since he's already experienced that kind of magic of having his own soul tethered to his portrait, he was able to recognize the diary for what it was, the remnants of a vessel that once held a soul. But he knew that it was different because obviously it used dark magic and he could feel the difference between the magic used to create the vessel of resting place for his soul and his own portrait versus the vessel that was created of the diary to store a living piece of the soul. So that's my theory. Portraits and horcruxes, really not that dissimilar. And that's why Dumbledore was able to recognize it for what it was. So let me know what you think. I really appreciate you guys and all that you do with the podcast. It has been a tremendous help for me in going through my postpartum. So I appreciate all that you guys do. I listen to you daily. Thanks, MuggleCast. Daily. Thank you, Brenna. That was really sweet. We don't really get much of an explanation about the diary other than that he heard he didn't know about the diary prior to the events of Chamber of Secrets, the book. So he starts hearing about it through Harry and Ginny, and I think he assumes it aligns with Tom Riddle. So he puts the pieces together that way. But no, I think this is a cool theory and a good like alternative. Like you, it's almost like you have two life paths you can choose from. I can aspire to split up my soul into multiple Horcruxes, or I can aspire to to be uh, portrait worthy <laughs> because I'm so mm. good. Yeah, I mean, other people that interacted with Tom Riddle's diary when it had uh, the part of his soul in it, though, like Lucius Malfoy, also would have interacted with portraits, surely, quite a bit. Uh, and Lucius didn't seem to, that we know of, make any connection as to what the diary really was. And it's interesting because uh, I would actually argue that probably portraits don't have anything to do with someone's soul. Um, it is interesting, though, that like Hogwarts headmasters, for instance, they have to die before their painting is created. That does kind of make it seem like the soul is transferring from their body to the portrait. But even photographs in the Daily Prophet of like Harry, for instance, um, have his personality. They have some remnants and uh, similarities to his personality. They move, but he hasn't necessarily lost his soul uh, at all during that process. I think the one point that she was trying to make though, is that the, the difference being like, if you were to look at a Dumbledore versus a Lucius in their handling of the diary, that Dumbledore had already commissioned for his portrait to be created. So he was already, in a way, aware of that type of magic that exists. Mm. And in this case, with a portrait, it's more of a positive attachment. Whereas in the case of a Horcrux, it's obviously a negative attachment. Yeah. I, th- I think it's an interesting way to to look at these two things. But- and, and the one thing I will say, though, is I don't know that with a portrait that a portion of the soul necessarily is in that portrait. Like in the Horcrux, a portion of the soul lives within the Horcrux and can bring you back to life, right? Mm-hmm. So I don't know. It's but very, then what it's, is in the portrait? I mean, it does capture your essence. So a part of the soul could kind fair. of make sense. See, and to that extent, I always assumed conversations with past headmasters would be unfulfilling. Um, Like there's that moment in Cursed Child where Harry has this meaningful moment with Dumbledore's portrait. I'm like, that would never happen because it's it's only surface level Dumbledore. It's only surface. Any Mm -hmm. any portrait is a a poor recreation of the real thing. I think that might be a quote from somewhere, too. It's only the information that that person has imparted upon the portrait, right? And clearly they can do other things like certain portraits can run within frames. We see that happen. Watch out for enemies. Yeah, but I think Dumbledore's portrait only knew in so much as he was willing to provide Harry with, right? Mm Because at the end of Half-Blood Prince, the portrait is asleep, right? The portrait doesn't even interact with Harry at all. It's not till Deathly Hallows that we see that happen. So 
I don't know, but I, I do think it's it's an interesting thing to think about. I, I like it. I like the parallels that Brenna was drawing. All right, this next voicemail comes from Katie about Rita Skeeter. Hi, this is Katie from San Diego, and I just wanted to comment on episode 648, the interview with Rita Skeeter in the broom closet. Y'all already touched on the fact that this was not appropriate at all, but I also wanted to highlight the fact that even though Harry is a champion, he was still an underage wizard, so there should have been a chaperone of some sort with him in that interview in the broom closet, whether it was McGonagall or Dumbledore who was taking charge of him in that moment. One of them should have been there. It should not have been up to the Dursleys because when you're out of school, the people at the school take charge of you and your safety while you're there, which also brings up an entire (laughs) argument about the Hogsmeade situation. However, in this sense where it was with an interviewer, it should have been a situation where someone was with Harry in that moment. And I think the fact that he was by himself and able to be pulled into there just shows how dirty Rita Skeeter was as an author and as a journalist and how kind of sleazy she was and also just how the ball was dropped in terms of keeping Harry safe after his name was pulled out of the Goblet of Fire. I mean, he was not really safe through the rest of the tournament, but I think in this sense, his mental mental health and well-being was really put at risk, and it just really shows how nasty Rita Skeeter was to approach a minor in that sense. Um, I also just want to say, love Pam on the episode. Thank you guys so much for what you do, and have a great day. Thanks, Katie, and we'll pass along the nice words to Pam. Harry needed a publicist with him during that interview. <laughs> McGonagall or Albus could have played publicist. I think that would have solved a lot of issues. And by not having, like I said on that that episode, by not having anybody else in that room, in that space, calling it a room is generous, Rita could report anything she wanted, and then it's her word against Harry's. All right, this next voicemail is from Katie about the three tasks. Hey, Mocast. It's Katie from California. I just wanted to have a comment about the most recent episode for chapter by chapter. I think the predictions that Harry and Ron make during their trans, their divination homework is what Harry does in the three tasks of the Trial of the Tournament. The first one he makes is get some burns. He gets some burns in the, in the dragon task. The second one is he loses a treasure possession. He in the second task he loses a treasure possession that he must find. And in the third one, he comes off worse in the fight. Voldemort comes back in the third task, and Harry loses that battle, but gets home back to Hogwarts safely. That's really cool. Yeah, that's awesome. I know we did some analysis of that homework, right? Of those predictions when we were reading through, but I don't think we connected the threads fully the way that Katie did here. Mm. And it's really cool the way she did it. That is yeah. Cool. All right. Next one comes from Maddie about Victor Crumb. Hi, my name is Maddie from Idaho, USA. Um, I just, okay, I've always wondered this about Victor Crumb, okay? He's supposed to be like 17, right? Because that's how old you're going to be in the Goblet of Fire, so be in that thing. And he is like this professional Quidditch player. So I wonder two things. One is he a little young to be a professional Quidditch player? Does that not matter in the wizarding world? Like how old he is, if he hasn't finished school yet. And then two, if he is, they're like, oh yeah, like that, he can be 17 to be a professional Quidditch player. Then why is he still going to school? Like what does he need to learn? Like if that's his career, could he homeschool or like do some other type of stuff? Get a personal trainer to teach him the magic he still needs? Like why does he still have to go to school? At a boarding, like all these wizarding wizarding schools or boarding schools, why does he have to go away for so long to school? Like, shouldn't he be training for Quidditch if that's the thing? I don't know. I don't get how he is in both of those things. How is he, like, essentially a high school student, but also a professional Quidditch player, and they haven't made him kind of pick one or another or given him a way to do both while trained for Quidditch all year long? Anyway, that has always confused me. So I hope you guys touch on it. Thanks. Bye. Mike, it's a sports question. 
<laughs> so it's mine. Is that what you're saying? Um, uh, I I will say I do think there's something to be said for playing for your national team. And that's what I saw this as, right? So we know Quidditch in the sense that there's all these different teams throughout the UK. We hear about them throughout the course of the Harry Potter series, but presumably there's also, and it's mentioned, I think, during one of the um, conversations at the borough, like there's actually a team for England, there's a team for Ireland, there's a team for Scotland. And so presumably if Victor is good enough, even if he plays at Durmstrang, to play for the Bulgarian national Quidditch team, regardless of how old he is. And that's what I think this is an example of. I think he's also an overachiever. Maybe it's like a little backup plan. Like, oh, if Quidditch doesn't work out, I can go and be an or, or if I'm not going to be an or, I can be a Quidditch player. It does. Yeah. It is interesting that at 18, 17, he is on a major Quidditch team. And able to compete in the cup. But isn't wouldn't you equate that? And I see Lydia doing it in the Discord. Like you could compare that to the Olympics. That's what the Quidditch yeah. World Cup essentially is. And and you have athletes of all sorts of ages that are compete in the Olympics. So And he's doing all kinds of training, you would think, for the Quidditch World Cup. And then he has to go and do the Triwizard Tournament. You're right. What, what a year <laughs> for him. It's a big year for Victor. Yeah, for sure. I, I, we do have on Ron's authority that he is only just eighteen or something. Uh, so he's actually eighteen <laughs> or something. We know he's at least seventeen because you have to be unless you're Harry to get into the Triwizard Tournament. But yeah, uh, yeah, he's he's said to be eighteen in the uh, Quidditch World Cup chapter. I just think that the reason he has to still go in school is because academics are important. How often do you hear and like athletes still have to cram for a test because if they fail it, they're off the team. I feel like it's very important to keep his education up. Maybe this is why Hermione had a crush on him. It was like, oh my gosh, he's a Quidditch star and he still prioritizes his schoolwork? Oh, dream man. A, yes. What a dream. Smart. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Smart people are sexy. Speaking yes. of sexy, let's talk about Voldemort. Okay. Final <laughs> voicemail from Nikki. Hi, Muggocast. This is Nikki. I was listening to your podcast about the Quidditch World Cup, and I had a thought. What do you think Voldemort would do if he encountered Avila? Is this pre or post Bellatrix? (laughs) (laughs) I think that Vila inspires um, lust, and I think Voldemort is capable of having that, not of having love obviously that's his book stated failing so i think that avila would turn his head just as she would anybody else's but but then he'd be like i need to resist i must resist (laughs) all this sexiness i've got business to take care of maybe it turns out your voldemort impression is as good as your dumbledore (laughs) we don't hear it as often it's just inspired by Ray Fiennes has nothing on you. Let's just say that. <laughs> Avada de Vila! I just don't think Vila would have any effect on Voldemort. Lust, love. He seems above it. He it, seems yeah. above it. He, his focus is on other things. Well, he seems, except the plot of Cursed Child tells us that he's not above no. human connection. You're right. You're right. You're right. But, but, but we're not considering that canon, are we? Right. <laughs> I'm not. It really depends. Well, thank you, Nikki. Thank you. And thank you to everybody who calls in with voicemails. We love when y'all call in. If you want to, you can call our phone number, which is 19203Muggle, or you can use the voice memo app on your phone. We do prefer the latter since it's higher quality. And just please keep your message around 60 seconds long so we can fit in as many voicemails and emails as possible. So with that, we'll move over to some emails. But first, we're going to take a quick break and check in on Voldemort. We'll be right back. All right. So our first email comes from Old Lady Nerd. And uh, (laughs) she's talking about Rita Skeeter. She says, Ahoy, y'all. I'm surprised no one has mentioned that Skeeter is a slang term for a mosquito a blood-sucking parasite. 
a very apt description of Rita, I think. And yeah, blood sucking. I'm also thinking about the sucking of the pen. Maybe there's something mm. there because we oh. still don't really know what's going on there. Now, it, in fairness, is Skeeter a uh, British slang? Because I don't th- think it's really American slang from from what I can tell, at least not here in the Northeast. Well, I pictured like Louisiana, like, oh, a Skeeter, you know, kind of thing. It doesn't need to be British specifically. For I it think to of work. Skeeter from Doug. I think of Skeeter mm. from uh, Nick Jr., Cousin Skeeter. Yeah, yeah. Oh, all from different D- Skeeters. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, I think we got We're schooled. We're connecting the threads. <laughs> we got schooled by Old Lady Nerd. I think that's fantastic. I think it's it really has good. to be intentional. Yeah, and we'll keep that in mind as we continue reading. Thank you, Old Lady Nerd. Uh, next email comes from Peggy Ann, also about Rita Skeeter. Uh, this time, her description Ahoy, y'all. I'm hoping you can discuss the descriptors the author uses for female characters, specifically Rita Skeeter. You previously discussed the way Fleur and Maxime have been described, but this time for my recent reread of chapter 18, The Weighing of the Wands, I was irked by the way Rita is described. I don't know if it's from looking at these books with a 2024 lens or because of how horrific the author is to the trans community on a daily basis on Twitter. It's that. Rita's hands in this chapter are characterized as large, mannish hands. Additionally, when you look at Jim Kay's drawing of Rita, it is far from the image I had in my head even before seeing Miranda Richardson's portrayal in 2005. Jim Kay's representation of Rita is a woman who is, let's say, not a looker. I don't know if the author was just trying to portray Rita as an ugly woman or saying she's more man than woman or not. As I mentioned, Kay's drawing is definitely not what I had in mind when imagining the character. I love what Miranda Richardson, the costumers, and the hair and makeup team brought to the character in the Goblet of Fire film, and it is something along those lines to what I always imagined for Rita Skeeter. Interested in hearing your thoughts and continuing the discussion of how female characters are described, portrayed by the author in this series. Thank you, Peggy Ann. Yeah, so I'm looking at Jim Kay's illustration right now of Rita Skeeter, and I don't, I don't know. I, it's giving sleazy gossip journalist to me. Now, as for the manly hands, it could be symbolizing her taking control. I think that even before. The author was making it against trans people. There was a lot of disdain for journalists and or not journalists. You know, journalist is a is actually a compliment. Uh, but but Rita Skeeter, we have seen is not that Rita Skeeter, the mosquito is actually a parasite <laughs> uh, and she's viewed as such. And so any attribute that can be thrown against Rita, um, you know, even that her hands aren't feminine, there's something mm. else like, you know is really meant to illustrate how blood sucking and inhuman uh, she is viewed or meant to be viewed, I think even in the story and her actions mm. back it up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree with that. And I, I think comparing it to Miranda Richardson's portrayal, Rita Skeeter has more of a sex appeal to her in the films. I think that's yeah. really fair to say because there's even that moment where the the quill brushes its end up against Crumb's face, mm. oh, and yeah, and so I, the way that she's portrayed in the movies is much different than how she's described in the books. And I know that on the All Girls episode that was done several months ago, they dove deep into a lot of these characters and how J.K. Rowling portrays women specifically in the Harry Potter series. And this would be another example of that. Yeah, for sure. And I'd say too about the difference between the movie. I I think the movie and Miranda Richardson's version like is a little bit more believable at somebody who gets to the level that she gets to, you know, and and being the only journalist in the wizarding world, uh, the only person who's able to like, she's using Using her her looks. Yeah. 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 Yep. Yep. As as an explanation. And in the books without that, uh, because she's described in many ways as unattractive, uh, she just then has to be like cutthroat, just very, very, very brutal. Uh, nobody would otherwise take a second look, but because of her, you know, horrible reputation that she's built up, you know, when she's in the room, you have to pay attention. So it's a much yeah. different 
way of explaining how that character got to where they are. The layer of sex appeal in the movie is interesting. I'm glad they added that layer, but I don't think we should put too much stock in this adaptation of the character because it is the movies. Like they took a lot of liberties when it came to casting and and the hair and what people were wearing for all of the characters. So I don't I when the point is brought up about the movies, I just can't put too much stock into it because it's not that's not canon itself. That was a mm-hmm. Hollywood decision, who to cast and how to make her look. Well, I, th- I think Hollywood realized they missed an opportunity in the characterization of Rita Skeeter in the books. Well, I'll bet you anything with the TV show, they're going to do the same thing they did with the movie. <laughs> make it a, a sexy lady who uses her sex appeal to get an interview. There you go. All right. Uh, so our next email comes from Andrea on what was the name of Harry's school? Really good question. <laughs> she says, Ahoy, y'all. After listening to your chapter discussion about the chapter, gob- The Goblet of Fire, I just wanted to add something that struck me while listening. On the night when Dumbledore explains about the Triwizard Tournament, he asked the students, quote, anybody wishing to submit themselves as champion must write their names and school upon a slip of parchment. When the goblet gives us the names of the champions, it uses these slips of parchment. Quote, 12 pages later, the champion for Durmstrang, he read in a strong, clear voice, will be Victor Crumb. So Dumbledore would have seen under what school Harry's name was put into the goblet. What are your thoughts on that? I hope you're all doing well and want to thank you for being my Harry Potter friends. I love listening to you, laughing along, and more often than not, commenting on what you say. Keep up the fantastic work. Greetings from Germany. Hey, I'm half German. So, uh, Ilvermorny. The answer is Ilvermorny. Could be. Or Mahatakura or any of the others. But I'll add that Barty Crouch uh, Jr., disguised as Mad-Eye Fakie, actually straight up says that the culprit must have put in a fourth school. So, there's definitely because the, the question. Because the goblet is only picking one name per school. Absolutely. So, that's there's your confirmation. Like, Dumbledore did see a school, and it has not been mentioned. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right, next email comes from Denise on why didn't Dumbledore use a tracing spell? My name is Denise and I'm from Brazil. I love your podcast. Thank you for your work. Thank you, Denise. Now, I was listening to the episode Professor Dumbledore and had an idea. I know that from a creative point of view, the spell that Newt uses to find Tina in Crimes of Grindelwald, the one that is yellowish and shows Tina's footprint and use of comma close to her, was created after the Harry Potter series. But can you imagine how the events would have turned out if Dumbledore had used that spell to know who was present in the vicinity the night before the goblet gave the names of the champions? I guess Moody would have been exposed much sooner. Thank you. Yeah, probably. I I I really like this. I do, too, in part because we were sharing a few different ideas of how this could have been locked down better. Somebody simply watching the goblet, taking turns, having security people on top of it, security guards on top of it, (laughs) some wizard camera or the tracing spell or handwriting analysis. Fingerprint analysis. This handwriting looks very similar to yours, does it not? (laughs) He probably just I've used seen like, this before, Alistair. <laughs> well, any good uh, criminal would just use their other yeah, hand right. than their writing hands. The next email also related to Mad Eye. This is from Maisie, and uh, she wants to know about the Marauders map. She says, "Ahoy, y'all! I've just listened to Goblet of Fire, Chapter 15, and thought, could Harry not see?" Mad Eye Fakey on the Marauders map. I don't know if this has come up before. It probably has, but it just came to mind while listening to this episode. Thank you. I love the podcast. Keep up the good work. It's a good question. Do and we... are we talking about just Barty Crouch Jr. on the Marauders yeah, map? I, I think that's what okay. she's saying. I don't think she's saying, like, why does it not say Mad Eye Fakey? I think she's saying, yes. why does it say <laughs> Barty Crouch Jr.? Because, in fairness, when Peter Pettigrew was running around, as scabbers, it showed him on the map. Well, it doesn't. It does, but it doesn't say junior. It says Bartimius Crouch. Oh. And it's actually a plot point later in the book um, during the egg and the eye that Harry. So first of all, for the first half of the book, Harry doesn't have his Marauders map. It's a um, it's a plot hole because if somebody gives it to him back or he's it's in his trunk or he's not using it at all. 
So that accounts for why Harry isn't suspecting anything now, like where Crouch Sr. isn't supposed to be. But later in the book, he goes to pull it out, expecting to see Snape, and it's actually Bartimius Crouch. So then they begin to suspect Barty Crouch Sr. When he's in Snape's office, according to Snail Song. Yeah. When Harry, I guess, is in... What good is this map then? Like, <laughs> well, maybe he's not well, consulting it, it too much. Right. Yeah. yeah, you're yeah, not... yeah. But I would probably be obsessed with it. Like it's like we've said before, it's like having all your friends on the Snapchat map or uh, the Find My app on iPhone. Like, yeah. Uh, but, yeah. You, you can also imagine it gets congested, you know, all the time. Like even if he's on there, you aren't, you're not yeah. necessarily going to see him. It's like trying to find Waldo. Yeah. Imagine how many people are on there. Maybe you can filter. By like professors, imposters, <laughs> students, Quidditch players, animals, <laughs> manipulators. Yeah. <laughs> Next email comes from Matthew about the Triwizard Tournament's secrecy. Matthew says, if they kept the Triwizard Tournament secret, did they also keep it a secret for the other schools? Did Durmstrang and Bobaton parents get a letter? Hey, your kid is going to be away for a while. <laughs> And then something quite dangerous, potentially. Well, and all, yeah, and also when did the sort of tryouts happen for like, you know, the top 20 students at each school were selected somehow? Um, so did they need like permission forms? And, you know, was there a competition to see who gets to enter the competition? I guess it would be considered an exciting extended field trip. So I could see parents being in favor of their kid being away for a while. It'd be like, um, mm-hmm. what's that called when you go abroad for like a semester? Um, for an exchange. Study abroad. Study abroad. Yeah, Study for abroad, an for an exchange student, that type of thing. Yeah, I, I know, absolutely. I agree with that. But But, you know, to Matthew's point, the question of notice is a good one. Um, how much in advance would anybody have, you know, had that? So is it is it really just the kids of Britain, sort of the Hogwarts students that are the host school that uh, the adult wizards are all able to keep the secret from because there's many more of them than there are of everyone else. So I yeah. do like to believe actually that it was announced or it was a matter of honor. Um, you know, remember too, like Draco flaunts that he knows it. Um, you know, a lot of other people know, except the Hogwarts group that we know about mm. what's going on. The only thing that I can think of, though, is that did they communicate the severity, the circumstances under which these students were traveling? Extending off of what you were saying, Eric, right? You have these 20 students that are being chosen from each school. Did they also say, by the way, your kid could enter a competition and uh, die. <laughs> yeah. Well, like, okay. Here's, here's, I'm going to pay a compliment to the Goblet of Fire movie. And this happens once in like every 10 years. Okay. The Goblet of Fire movie, Dumbledore's line, eternal glory. <laughs> that is not in the books. Mm. And it dramatically summarizes how you would get the buy in from parents or students yeah. in this case, telling the parents that they have a chance for their child to represent their country. And also wizards everywhere, if they win that eternal glory at the end of the maze, the third task, that's going to give every parent would be proud, especially if they're like Cedric's dad, you know? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Oh, you can do it, my boy. Like he's very child forward. Their child is their world, but they want their kid to have that glory because they want to live vicariously through them. So I think there will be plenty of uh, jocks whose parents would absolutely want them in this (laughs) competition. All right, let's keep moving along here. This next one is from Lucy on how the first three books mirror the three Triwizard Tasks. Another theory about the Triwizard Tasks. My name is Lucy, and I'm a huge Harry Potter fan. I've read the books over 60 times since I fell in love with the series five years ago. The reason that I'm emailing you is to tell you about this theory that I thought of. I believe that the first three Harry Potter books foreshadow each task in the fourth book. In the first book, Harry is introduced to dragons when Hagrid adopts one illegally, and in the first task of the Triwizard Tournament, he has to go against the dragon. In the second book, Harry meets Moaning Myrtle, who helps Harry figure out the second task. She also mentions that she occasionally gets flushed out into the lake when someone uses the bathroom, and that is where the second task happens. In the third book, we are introduced to Peter Pettigrew and Remus Lupin. 
Peter was the one who killed Cedric Diggory in the graveyard, and Lupin taught Harry how to produce a Patronus and his class about Bogarts. If Harry hadn't learned this in his third year, then he wouldn't have survived the third task. I just randomly thought this theory up a few weeks ago, and I thought you would enjoy hearing it. Love ya, Lucy. Thank you, Lucy. And that's great. That's beautiful. It's all led to this. <laughs> yeah. I, lo- I love the connecting of the threads. It's very well yeah. done. Our next email is from Henny on the teaching degrees in the Wizarding World. And they say, Ahoy, y'all. I hope you're well. I'm listening to episode 643 and started to think about teaching degrees in the Wizarding World. We know that teaching isn't an easy job that anyone can do, especially without formal education. Do we think the Wizarding World has a degree diploma one has to get before starting to teach at Hogwarts or any other school based on the books and some of the teachers we know, Hagrid, Trelawney, I would say no, (laughs) but what do you think? (laughs) Love the pod, stay healthy, all the best. Henny, your friendly Finnish witch. Well, to your point, Henny, things at Hogwarts are a little loosey-goosey. And while (laughs) a degree would put you ahead of the competition, it's not required. Yes, we do not know much of anything about continuing education of any sort in the wizarding world. Uh, Even if you learn a trade, there's not sort of a formal process about it. The only thing I think we ever hear about ever at all is Auror training, uh, which seems to be a bit more like studying additional potions, additional defense and that kind of a thing. But so for teaching, you know, who's teaching these classes, who's teaching these Aurors, you know, other Aurors, like I think it is very much that the teachers at Hogwarts don't have teaching degrees. They are just proclaimed experts of their field, either by their peers or they have experience in their in their field um, enough to say, yeah, I can do so I can teach. I can do so I can teach. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah, like probably that... like how teachers, I mean, they, I know they had universities in the 1800s, but I very much think of it as like, a, you know, you're you're in the Wild West and a guy comes to town and he says he knows medicine. And it's like, oh, great. We need a doctor. You're the doctor. And the <laughs> next day you're doing surgery or fixing cholera or whatever, you know, like it's it's a big deal. Right. And I'm just thinking about how much a position like Defense Against the Dark Arts turns over the likelihood that you're going to have somebody with a degree or a diploma to fulfill that role. I think there's certain criteria, certainly that you need certain achievements maybe within the wizarding world that would qualify you for certain positions. That said, I think that Henny brings up a really good point with Hagrid. Hagrid is, aside from being a lover of all beasts, has zero qualifications to teach students. Yeah, I hope that once they are hired for the job over the summer in advance of starting this job, they get some training at school, how to deal with students, how the school runs, take a couple of meetings with Dumbledore or whoever the headmaster is. Like, I hope there's some training even after after they're hired to get them up to speed a, at least a little bit. I would I would hope that at least there's newt level credentials for most of these. Positions. I'm thinking of like your Snapes, your McGonagall's, your Sprouts, your Flitwicks. Like they seem like they have pretty legit credentials to do the work that they mm-hmm. do. Uh, we do have a real time correction, which I love. I love, love, okay. love. Um, we do hear about another profession that does have some schooling and it's a residency at St. Mungo's. Uh, you can be a trainee healer and, uh, yep. And that is from Jiggly Jane, as well as uh, Magizoology 101 that says you can be a trainee healer. So there are some medical professions at Mongo's that do require additional training, residency, schooling, same thing. So okay. basically, that just reaffirms that Hogwarts is a free for all. Well, the, <laughs> the school itself will teach you like, you know, we don't necessarily see a nursing class of sixth and seventh years studying under Madame Pomfrey, but that's not to say it didn't happen. This next email is uh, pretty interesting because it may offer uh, a retort to the Rita Skeeter stuff we were talking about earlier. Um, Ashley sends in, ahoy y'all. <laughs> With the chapter by chapter right now focusing on Goblet of Fire and soon Order of the Phoenix again, 
I'd like to point out something that when it comes to the themes in these books, there are many discussions with these two books about media, publishing, and lack of trust in the government. I think a small but significant thing to keep in mind when looking at those themes is that there are less than three years between the death of Princess Diana and Goblet of Fire being published. This means that the book was written in the heat of theories regarding the royal family's involvement and the ramifications of tabloid stories in the UK and globally. I'd love to hear your thoughts. That's some important context, yeah. Incredibly important. Absolutely. The paparazzi and the role of tabloid media in the death of Princess Di um, and just their role in society. What are they for? Um, was a hot topic. And they remain in the headlines. Where are you, Kate Middleton? Where are you? I've been following all of that. I'm fascinated. Now it's cool investigative, like individuals (laughs) on X that are like really figuring it out. Uh Yes, this was an amazing point. So thank you for sending it in, Ashley. And the next one comes from Abby. He says, I have had this thought for a while, but I thought this uh, would be a perfect time to tell you. You have talked about how bad the Goblet of Fire is at its job. And that the sorting hat has nothing to do for most of the year. Well, I can kill two birds with one stone. Fire the goblet of fire and let the sorting hat take over. It will remove the chances of someone cheating the goblet because the sorting hat knows everyone and knows their ages and handwriting. He is also sentient so no one could find a loophole in the system. It will also give the sorting hat something to prepare for in his off time. He could make a song for the Triwizard Tournament or maybe even help design the three trials. I really think that this is a good idea and I want to know what you think about it. I love it. I love it. I'm very concerned about what the sorting hat is doing in between sorting he ceremonies. Needs a side hustle. Yeah. I think it'd be fun for him to come up with some trials too. He could think about the students that he studies and think about, you know, like how the how to thread the needle in terms of des- designing the perfect tasks. So I'm he all for done a this. Much better job. Much better job. I the agree. Goblet. Okay. Next email comes from Angie on the domestication of house elves. And she said, Ahoy, y'all. I was listening to the conversation about house elves, and it made me think about, and go with me on this, the domestication of dogs. Some people say dogs were domesticated by people, but others say they domesticated themselves. There are some dogs who love to be with people, and some like livestock guardians who love to be outside with the flock working and protecting. What if house elves domesticated themselves and enjoy working for wizards? Some wizards are terrible, just like there are terrible dog owners. But what if most wizards understand the nature of the elves and let them do their thing with the relationship like people have with their dogs? Not that the house elves are dogs by any means, but just reframing the view of the argument. Interesting, but I I, I think the whole point about house elves in the harry potter books is that they are enslaved i mean this is like a lesson we are to take from this so i like i like the different frame of mind angie but ultimately eh. yeah and i think one of the key things to keep in mind here too and we're just talking about a level of sentience with the sorting hat house elves are their own like they have a level of sentience themselves right whereas dogs really don't so it's like to make that comparison is a tough one. It's um, problematic too. Y- y- yeah. So, Potentially. This is all fictional characters. No, so we're no. not and, and, and I like it. to Andrew's point. I do like the fact that Angie is trying to kind of reimagine how we look at the situation, but I think it's clear from even when Dobby explains to Harry in chamber of secrets, like the history of house elves, like this wasn't, this wasn't a choice that they made. They didn't. They didn't domesticate themselves. Like they were enslaved by right, wizards. Like, like your your dog would never tell you, "I want to be free." The way the Dobby would have had he been given the possibility. Like, yeah. I mean, Andrew, how would you feel if Brooklyn was like, "I'm out of here"? I, I, <laughs> <laughs> I'd say no, bad dog. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why it's slavery. Because not every house elf who feels the way Dobby does gets that choice. Exactly. Uh, Next email is from Sarah, also talking about house elves, but specifically related to laundry. And she says, I was wondering if anyone had commented on your comments about the house elves doing laundry. Y'all keep mentioning that they take care of cooking, cleaning, and laundry at Hogwarts, but how can they do the laundry? Wouldn't that make them free? 
And in book five or six, when Hermione knits and leaves hats for the elves, she purposefully puts trash on top to trick them into picking it up. So that begs the question, who does the laundry in Hogwarts? Just something I keep thinking about each time it comes up. I, I still think they do the laundry. Like It's different if somebody is giving them clothing to free them versus just right. hair, do yes. the wash. What's the intention yes. behind it? The intent exactly. to give them laundry is to make them work to clean it, not to wear it. <laughs> a thousand percent. I think it. this would be my answer as well. There is a special magical deed in the gifting of clothing. That's why it's such a big thing. Because owners give their house elves their clothes all the time to wash. But it's way different when it's like this is... And and so it kind of calls into question the loophole of Lucius freeing Dobby in the end because he didn't know he was giving it. But the mm. intention was to free him all the same. I think that house elves have a sixth sense about that. And so the house elves that are uh, offended by Hermione uh, are able to sense what she's doing. And that's why they avoid it. That's why the Gryffindor dormitory doesn't get cleaned for a long time is because they they are they can sense it and they're repulsed by what she's doing because they know that if they touch it, they won't have a job anymore. And uh, Pax brings up a good point in the Discord saying that there is kind of a gray area for how Dobby was freed because Lucius never had the intention of freeing Dobby by handing him that book, right? That's what in I'm fact, saying. Yeah, right. like it. that's why it's a. That's why that doesn't work really anymore. But if Harry put the sock in the book with the intention that that sock that sets Dobby free then the sock is magified with oh, okay. mm -hmm. set you free energy. And then Lucius doesn't think about it, passes it on. Yeah. But it's it still like has to count because Lucius. Along. Yeah, but only Lucius could actually free Dobby. So Lucius did hand Dobby a sock that was charged with set you free energy. Didn't right. revoke the I, set you free energy when he did it. That's <laughs> There it is. It's explained. I think the real answer, though, is that Hogwarts students... They don't go to the bathroom. They don't shower. They don't change their clothes. So uh, I do feel like there should be a spell to just clean your clothes. That seems like a simple one that could be dreamed up. Yeah, especially if it's only like a day old or like you only just wore it um, half the day. So here we go. But uh, our next email is actually my one of my favorite emails that we've ever gotten. Uh, mm. It's from Angie. <sighs> Ahoy all, I was listening to your episode about Mad-Eye Fakie and your discussion how the other students in Hermione didn't think about who made the food at Hogwarts. As a mom of young kids, I can 100% see how none of the kids noticed. Go with me. Besides being highly <laughs> self-centered at this age, which is developmentally normal, developmentally normal for kids this age to think they are the center of the universe and everyone will notice that pimple on their face, most kids don't know what their parents, parents, guardians do to make a house run and may not ever notice the extent of the work until they move out on their own. My kids see me cook regularly, but there are days when food magically appears and they are genuinely surprised by how a plate of snacks shows up on the table. Usually they don't ask me how I made or did anything. They know their sheets get changed, but almost assume it's magic. My running joke is that as soon as they get taller than I am, I'm going to get a shirt that says Dobby on it and wear it around the house. I love that. Listen, and Angie, you got to take time for yourself if you don't already. This seems like a, a tough situation mm -hmm. and but you're I'll doing a great thing, which is raising children. But make sure that you're giving yourself the time. Yeah, but I'll take some pizza rolls first, if that's okay. Oh, man. <laughs> that like magically a... appear. That'd be a fun surprise. Oh, yeah. yeah, it's hilarious. Thank you for sending and that email. This is the same Angie from two emails ago, and I love how in both emails, she used the phrase, go with me. <laughs> don't worry, Angie. Me. You don't have to, like, you know, try and we're, hold our attention. With we're with yeah. you always. <laughs> The next email is from Rebecca on Barty Crouch Jr. And she says, Aloha Bora, Mugglecast. I've always thought that Fake Moody was one of Harry's better teachers. While he may have been harsh at times, he treated the students like adults and taught them about real life spells and horrors in the wizarding world. He gave them the opportunity to practice defending themselves in a controlled environment. During my latest read through of the book, I got to thinking about why he was such a good teacher. Did he just get wrapped up in the acting? 
Or did he actually have a passion for teaching students and was teaching them things he wished he had learned? Barty Crouch Jr. spent years suffering under his father's imperious curse. Perhaps he had students practice overcoming the curse so that they don't ever suffer like he did. We don't know much about Barty Crouch Jr.'s motivations for becoming a Death Eater. All we really see is a scared boy at a trial crying for his parents. What if during the first war, he wasn't even a real Death Eater? What if he was under the imperious curse when torturing Neville's parents? Or maybe he just fell into the wrong crowd, but didn't care much about Voldemort and his cause, and wasn't a very loyal Death Eater. Maybe he only became a powerful loyal Death Eater after his father said, quote, you are no son of mine, as if to say to his father, quote, if this is who you think I am, this is what I'll become. Would love to hear your thoughts on this, Rebecca. This is an amazing theory. I love it. I don't have any notes other than yes. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, like, like there's so much about this that is so thoughtful and the fact that he is teaching these kids the imperious curse so that they can protect themselves in the future from a fate that he himself suffered for a period of his life and he could enjoy acting and he could enjoy teaching too well yeah i mean he loves everything about this primarily because he's sticking it to his father right like Mm. that is clear but in terms of his loyalty, though, like I wonder a little bit about that because clearly in Goblet of Fire, he is very loyal to Voldemort. So, but yeah, but it is interesting to think about too. Like, uh, he doesn't seem like this um, mega Death Eater, Voldemort's most loyal supporter in the courtroom scene in the pensive. Uh, in the movie, he does. In the movie, it's it's very clear. But in the book, he seems just like a teenager who got caught up in the action. So this idea that he might have been under the curse himself uh, when he was younger is is really interesting. Um, and definitely, I think that Moody enjoys teaching period or Mad-Eye Fakey enjoys teaching period. I think that he is really relishing. There's room for all of these uh, multiple truths here. But I, I think that it's pretty clear from our analysis already of the character that he loves to do what he's doing. Even if he's just even if just what he's doing is sticking it to Death Eaters or sticking it to dad, um, he loves doing it for sure. Yeah. All right. This next email comes from Darren on what Arthur did for Ludo. My name is Darren, a.k.a. Jiggly Jane, who just came up a few minutes ago and have been a longtime listener of y'all since day one. Thank you, Darren. I just wanted to chime in about the debate about why Ludo gave tickets to the World Cup to Arthur and the gang. In the book, when they are all sitting down to dinner the night before the World Cup, Arthur is speaking to Percy, and he does mention that he did Ludo a favor by helping his brother out with a lawnmower with unnatural powers, and then he smoothed the whole thing over. Mm. Love you guys. All right. Well, Well, my boat theory was, yeah... (laughs) Undo declare canon. Well, it was fun while it lasted. It was. Thank you, Darren, for catching that. All right. Uh, next email is from Jason talking about the killing curse. And he says, Good day from Tasmania, Australia. I've been listening to MuggleCast constantly since around episode Ooh. 50. I went back and listened to the first 50 as well and would be one of your oldest listeners at 54 years young. I uh, just listened to episode 644. A couple things jumped out. In the discussion on Avada Kedavra, Micah mentioned that every time you kill by using Avada Kedavra, it splits your soul. In Half-Blood Prince, chapter 23, we found out from Slughorn's memory that it splits the soul by an act of evil, the supreme act of evil, by committing murder. So from reading that, it would seem if a wizard uses it in self-defense, or an Auror uses it in the line of duty, it wouldn't split the soul. With the Imperious Curse, I thought back to the Vila in a previous chapter and wondered if they have a quote-unquote built-in Imperious Curse, or even a variant Imperious Curse, which makes people do all the strange things they do. Would love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, it, it makes sense to me in terms of the... Slughorn line by an act of evil, the supreme act of evil. Evil. So the intent has to be evil. It can't be self-defense, is what we're saying. Like, well, if- I I think that 
it, it's hard to tell what is uh, Slughorn's own personal like um, embellishment on this. But I think that a human killing a human is going to split the soul, even if in self-defense. I think that that's why there's that argument like Dumbledore is like your soul matters more than mine. Um, you know, like the purity of your your soul, like he and then Snape's like, OK, screw my soul. Then I think that no matter what, it's going to split your soul because that's how we weigh humanity against sort of the wild. We are the only sentient but, species. But yeah. Moody is an aura, as Jason reminds us, too. And he has like a free pass almost. Well, oh yeah, that's that's a good point. But he's a license to use it, let's say. Th- but there, there's actually precious few times in which uh, I think having a very split up soul is going to come into play and affect you. If your soul is is distant from yourself, that's what made Voldemort so unhinged and less human as time went on, is he had actually separated his soul. It wasn't the actual like crack in it, like a sprained ankle, but actually the removal of and storage of his soul in different parts, I think, made him less human than if he had just had, you know, killed a bunch of people and not done that. Right. Mm -hmm. I I mean, I like what you said, Eric, about it's more of a representation of Slughorn's character in this moment, the way that he's talking. It reveals more about him, the fact that he would reference it in this way. But I do think at the end of the day, the killing curse is the killing curse and it does rip the soul. Now, you could argue, is it equal when you kill a spider versus killing a human? No, that's where I that's where I'm getting tripped up here. Like, what are we debating right now? Are we debating the spider specifically or are we debating it in general? Because the spider, I mean, he's using the spider to teach a class. On the other hand, like, what is a supreme act of evil? Is it killing an innocent spider? Some would argue that. You could argue the casting of the spell itself is a supreme act of evil, regardless of what it's being used on. And in what context, like teaching? I'd also like to believe that even though auras are the Wizarding World's version of police officers, in many, many, many countries across the world, police officers don't commit murder. Or don't have guns. Or they're taught they're taught to de-escalate at all costs before resorting to um, that level of force. And so uh, Moody's own personal AK record might actually be pretty light uh, or lighter than we are expecting to when we think about cops and murder count but i guess you know if we're to think of it in this context right like if you're walking down the halls of hogwarts and you step on a spider does that rip the soul <laughs> or is no. it only by no, using... but that's like an accident potentially well is it <laughs> not if you're ron <laughs> he's gonna do everything to kill it um I don't like it's an interesting question. The, the the second part of this though, I feel like we've talked a little bit about it before. Eric, I think you made the reference to the sirens and how like in mythology they're very much comparable to the Vila in that, you know, the the sounds that they make kind of it, it was the Odyssey, right? With if you if you get Yeah, yeah, it's entrancing and it's um it it, it is a there's a difference here between um, something that is naturally intoxicating or like, I don't know if they use um, pheromones or th- like things in nature that occur that um, take your agency away in a little or like psychotropic drugs um, versus a spell that's doing it. So a incendio uh, or wow, imperious charm, uh, you know, that that specifically is designed to take your agency away and make you do the will, make you follow the will of the caster is not altogether that different than, um, you know, somebody with like that natural ability like the VL have. So I do agree there's a connection. The next email comes from Ivan, who says, hello, team. I'm slowly catching up with chapter by chapter, and I bring a little correction from the Christmas discussion on book two. I'm so glad we got to this. Laura said that we didn't know if Harry had even read Ron's gift flying with the cannons. But we do. In book four, it is said that he reread it for the 10th time. And Aww. that comes up in chapter 22. I love that. Harry loves his present from Ron. It all ties back to Goblet of... All these emails tie back to Goblet of Fire in some way. Oh, all the answers are right here very in the clever, middle book. Very clever. Very smart. That's why we're rereading. 
And this is from Isabel on common room slash dorm rules. Ahoy, (laughs) y'all. I think we got to update it now that we have a new Muggle Mail episode out. Like, it's time to come up with a new opening line. Now that Ludo Bagman is a lie. Yeah, Yeah. that's right. Ahoy, y'all. Hogwarts houses. It's kind of sad that non-housemates aren't allowed in the common room or dorms when you think about it. What if your best friend is in another house? Then there can't ever be the magical equivalent of late night movie watching or hanging out in the dorm swapping secrets. Think of the Patel twins from the books. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, Hogwarts is very large, so there's plenty of places to hang out, but there is something cozy and and secluded and private about the common room where like a hangout think that could be good. It's course corrected after the the series was written that there could be some level of inter-house mingling that went on. Maybe if you're a prefect, yeah. you could go into the other common rooms. I don't know. It just se- it does seem kind of silly. Court said, "Well, actually, I don't know. I don't. I don't think. I don't see a reason for it to be course corrected post series. I mean, you can't do it in Hogwarts Legacy, right? So- well, it's a crowd control thing to me. I mean, you got to have somewhere <laughs> you can escape the other students, right? <laughs> but Court yeah. said, maybe there's a common common room." <laughs> Ooh. there's a prefect's bathroom and presumably you know <laughs> hang out in the great hall i guess i i just again there's so many places in hogwarts to hang out that i guess that's their answer if you want to mm-hmm. hang out with other house people well andrew i feel like we've saved the best email for a lot this was literally my favorite email of the entire bunch wow oh, yeah. okay so this is from jake Ahoy, y'all. <laughs> Loving <laughs> chapter course. by chapter. I was just wondering if maybe Percy purposely went along with or maybe even originally in- introduced himself to Crouch as Weatherby to hide his association with Arthur. His embarrassment then also comes from his family potentially finding this out. Okay. I like that. Yeah. I mean, this is something I don't think we've ever considered, but it's in Percy's character to do this. We know how he thinks about his father and how his father is perceived at the ministry. And by allowing these names to go on, he's not associated with the Weasley family. and Which he later I, tries to do further. <laughs> right. <laughs> Disassociate. Yeah. I Yeah. That's a really good theory. Um, I still stand by what I had suggested a few episodes ago, which is that he didn't have the guts to correct him either. He is like, yes, sir. Yes, sir. You're amazing, sir. You're perfect, sir. Anything you say, sir. So there's that to consider. But it's also very convenient that he also gets to uh, it works out for him, I should say, that he gets to disassociate from his family Um, and to his credit, he gets to build a reputation on his own work his own time at the ministry instead of riding on his father's coattails, even though those coattails aren't that great to ride on. It would be interesting to see if he's consistently called Weatherby throughout, because Mm. in Half-Blood Prince, Slughorn bungles Ron's name a million times in a million different ways. Mm. But I feel like for Barty Crouch Sr., he's consistent with what he calls him. Yeah. So that would lend itself to this theory that Percy isn't doing anything to tell Barty Crouch Sr. otherwise. And maybe it's because he's like, I don't want to be associated with my father. He's, it's, he's, he's it's constantly. Yeah. yeah. To, to consider. I think that uh, I love the idea that Crouch just like that Percy is so unimportant versus how important Percy thinks he is that, you know, it's our, our more standard understanding of it, which is like this guy's not giving Percy the time of day and he's trying to look great. Um, but if you remember Umbridge's backstory back from when we were reading book five, Umbridge's backstory on Pottermore is given that she tried to disassociate herself from her father as well, who also worked at the ministry. Um, And so I, in this case, it would be a connection between Percy and Umbridge. Hmm. And they're both very ambitious characters. So I can see it. And they're on the same page for most of Order of the Phoenix. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Well, that wraps up the... uh... 
muggle mailbag. We do have one chicken soup for the muggle cast soul. Bring us home, Micah. Bring us home. It is from Heather who says, hey guys, I first listened to muggle cast way back when it first came out in 2005 when I was a senior in high school. I'd listen to the episodes on my long bus rides to and from school while my relationship to Harry Potter has had its ups and downs since then. I've recently found my way back to the comfort and nostalgia of the wizarding world. One of the first things I did was look up MuggleCast and was pleasantly surprised to find that not only are you all still going strong, but your discussions are as interesting as ever. I've been listening to the chapter by chapter episodes and it really feels like not a day has passed. It's like catching up with old friends. Oh, thank you, Heather. Thank you, Heather. Aww. Yeah. What an appropriate email for our 650th episode as well. And I agree. I mean, one of the joys that we get from doing this show these days is our discussions on the series and the character motivations and the themes and all these things have evolved so much as adults. Proud adult readers of the Harry Potter mm. series, mm. Mary and Margulies. Mm. <laughs> and I'm very glad that you feel that way. And I think other listeners do as well. There's so much to discuss. Even today, I get I get comments from people. What do you talk about these days? I'm like, <laughs> we can easily do 90 minutes on Harry Potter every what week. What don't we talk about? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Try us. <laughs> we just did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we just did. We could go for another 45 minutes <laughs> tonight easily. easily. <laughs> and we're going to because we're going to record a bonus Mungo cast. <laughs> well, thank you, Heather. And thanks to everybody who wrote in. Whether or not we read your email on air, we really, really appreciate that you take the time to send in the voicemails, the emails. We do read and listen to everything that is submitted. If you have any feedback about today's episode or other chapter-by-chapter installments, you can email or send a voice memo to mugglecast at gmail.com, or you can use our phone number, which is 19203-MUGGLE. That's 19203684453. If you're calling us, please keep your message around 60 seconds so we can try to get to as many voicemails as possible. And next week... Back to chapter by chapter, we'll be discussing Gobble to Fire Chapter 20, The First Task. And now it's time for our weekly trivia game, Quizage. Last week's question, what class does Cedric Diggory have next when Harry catches up with him to tell him about the dragons? And the correct answer was Charms class. Correct answers were submitted by a little winky drinky, Amanda, Bang Ended Scoot 18, Becca, Buff Daddy, Draco's Etsy Badge Shop, Elizabeth K, Evil Ringo, Fakey Dakey Makey Makey No Mistakey, Fred and George's <laughs> Overall Mental Stability, Harry's Cruel Summers. Ooh. I just got my PhD and wanted to share with you all. Oh, congrats. Jiggly Jane. Katie from Hufflepuff, Elsie, Megwitch, Merlin, and some most baggy fronts, Morg97, my Accio brings all the brooms to the yard. That's hilarious. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> that That's uh, maybe my favorite. That's what's the happening inks. in the next chapter, right? Yeah, we got <laughs> yeah. a couple of other really long titled ones. I'm going to try and get through them. The Ink Spitting All Over, A Guide to Advanced Transfiguration, The Marshmallows Harry's Legs Are Made Out Of, the Pillsbury Doughboy, who is feeling very offended at being compared to Dumbledore because he thinks his laugh is perfect and he perfects it for hours for his commercials. I mostly just wanted to hear you say that. <laughs> well, you got your wish. Okay, there you go. We love Cedric. He is so sympathetic. But if he dies again, it is probably genetic. Okay. Uh, and two more. Winky by the fire with the butterbeer. Okay. And you're a quizard, Harry. Love it. So love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. That was a big 650 edition of Quizich. Here is next week's question. What is the first bit of Professor Moody's advice to Harry about the first task? That happens next chapter. To celebrate us getting back to chapter by chapter, submit your answer to us on the Quizich form mugglecast.com slash quizich or go to the mugglecast website and click on quizich from the main nav to celebrate this milestone episode of mugglecast 
we recommend hitting up mugglemillennial.etsy.com. We'll have the link in the show notes as well, where you can buy many cool MuggleCast items that we've given away over the years. And we have extras and we want to get them into the hands of listeners. And we're also using it as an opportunity for you all to support the show if you can. So hit up mugglemillennial.etsy.com. We have signed album art. We've got our cozy, comfy combo pack, which is the MuggleCast beanie and the socks at one reduced price. We have wooden cars. We have t-shirts and other items. Again, that's mugglemillennial.etsy.com. You can go to MuggleCast.com for transcripts, social media links, our full episode archive, our favorite episodes, and to contact us. And if you enjoy the show and think your other Harry Potter friends would too, tell those friends about the show. And we'd also appreciate if you left us a review in your favorite podcast app. And this show is brought to you by Muggles Like You. We don't have any fancy corporate or network funding. It's just us doing our best to put on this show week to week. We are proudly an independent podcast, and we always want to keep it that way. So not only can you go to our Etsy shop to support us that way, but if you're an Apple Podcast user, you can tap into the show and hit that subscribe button, and that's going to get you two bonus MuggleCast installments every month, plus ad-free and early access to MuggleCast. And then there's patreon.com slash MuggleCast. You get all the benefits that I just mentioned, plus live streams, planning docs, the chance to co-host the show one day, a new physical gift every year, and more. So check it all out, patreon.com slash MuggleCast. That does it for the 650th time. Thanks, everybody, for listening. I'm Andrew. Thank you, everyone. I'm Eric. And I'm Micah. Thank you. And ahoy. Goodbye. Goodbye.